Welcome to Promise Fellowship. Going to check our sound here. How's everybody? We're here, and it seems to be actually working this time, hopefully. Hopefully. I'll start praying. Lord, we praise you. We praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for, um, for your heart. God, your desire is that none should perish. And Lord, this day, we ask that you would reveal yourself. I ask that you'd reveal yourself to whoever it is that you desire to speak to this very day. God, I thank you for hearing our heart's cries, even, even when we're not verbalizing them. God, you know our needs, you know our desires, and you know... You know exactly what we need, when we need it. And God, you are the one who provides, and you're the one who sustains. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for hearing us. I thank you for knowing us. God, you created us, and you created us in your image, and that was a good thing. And Lord, I pray that uh, this day that we would just come alive as you do rest upon us. God, we're going to sing rest on us and we invite you holy spirit to do that we pray that you would flow through us god people who don't know you that they would just come alive that they'd be awakened thank you jesus thank you jesus so i'm going to be teaching in a little bit and the message today is called hungry it's a question mark hungry did you come hungry today did you come hungry for the lord so you may be physically hungry but I, I just, I'd encourage you just to try to focus your eyes on the Lord. Just lay it aside just for a couple hours out of your week and just worship the Lord because the Word tells us what He inhabits the praises of His, of His people. And there's fullness of joy in what? In the presence of the Lord. So we're going to sing. You guys can stand, please. As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit can move on the rise.
to give us eternal life. And we praise you and we thank you for what you're going to do in this place today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Timothy's going to come up and do a five minute. Hello. Testing. We're live. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the house of God. There's no greater place that I'd rather be but here, here in the house of God, worshiping in him in spirit and truth. And the title of my message is tonight is called Discipleship. Being in a discipleship taught me to learn to follow Jesus Christ and not to follow myself and do my own thing. It's not my will to be done. It's God's will to be done. But the verse that I have for this, Luke 14:26. And when you get there, say amen. He said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In John 21, 7, it says, Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fishers, the fishers' coat, unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Only John recognized Jesus in a den of morning light undoubtedly because Jesus had performed a similar miracle earlier and when I joined my first discipleship it's when I went to Teen Challenge in Phoenix, Arizona and was it hot there in the summertime Work at, working in the heat at 115 degrees in the summer. But when you, if you see snow in Arizona, you're tripping. Because as cold as it gets there, it's just 40 degrees. Because you're in, you're in the desert. But I know Flagstaff, Arizona, they receive snow. But my experience in Teen Challenge was learning how to go door to door and tell them my testimony of what Jesus was doing in my life. And we go and get to no donations for the ministry. We also 
had one property we s we stayed on, and it was a hotel type atmosphere, two floors. We had to do deck scrubbing on both floors. We also had a car wash on the property, and we also had to had a yard sale at the end of the property. It was fun. And we had school, which is like our Bible study time. So we can study the the word. And uh, the first word I've ever uh, learned was patience. It, it was a virtue. And patience is a hard word to, to learn especially when you're not a real patient person, especially when you want things now and you don't want to wait for it. You expect it now. But God says, be patient and wait. I am with you. And I do things in my time, not in yours. See, I, got, I also learned Matthew 10, 1. It's, talk, it's talking about the Matthew 10, 1, anointing. And it says, And when he had called unto his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. What is COVID? COVID's a disease and a sickness, right? God gave us the power to cast it out in his name and plead the blood of Jesus against it. And then last week we were asked uh, what promises has God given me or given you? And the first promise that I've ever, ever had from my father by his voice audibly was that 3 o'clock in the morning I was dead asleep and the spirit came in and says, Isaiah 43 one he said but you but this saith the Lord that created thee which has created you O promise O faith house and he that formed thee O promise O faith house Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. He also gave me a Jeremiah 33, 3. It says, call unto me, and I will answer, and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. He also gave me Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the thoughts that I have, that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I have also promised you I'd never leave you nor forsake you. I am always there with you, even until the very end. The reason why Jesus came, he came to die on the cross to forgive each and every one of us of our sins and to cleanse us by his blood. He said, no sickness can stand against the power of the blood. Amen. Joshua, are you able to do the tithes and offering?
Thank you, Timothy. I like that promise that you presented. So Joshua's going to do the tithes and offerings. I'll let Tim pray and go from there. Thank you, Tim. Am I there? We go. I uh, hear me. Lord, can now can we hear you? Ah, uh, so prayer requests. I see in the back. Okay, Janice. Okay. Yes. I felt. Ooh, ouch. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, a comment? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any more? Okay, I know one of the churches, all their pastoral staff had COVID last week. So... So, Lord, we thank you that you've called us. You call us your children. Jesus, you called us friends. Lord, you said we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Lord, so we come crying out to you, Abba, Father, we need you. Lord, your kids are crying out. Lord, he for Janice. Lord, who's experienced a stroke. Lord, I just pray for a, a re total recovery that all the symptoms will be gone and she'll be restored to health. I just pray for your comfort. Lord, say consider it all joy when you encounter trials Lord so we just pray for joy for Janice during this time Lord we pray for Pastor Don Lord and his health Lord your words Jesus you say that by your stripes we are healed so we declare your word over Pastor Don we just pray for recovery from the fall Lord, as well as that touch on his lungs, Lord, for your divine touch there, we just pray that you will just, your word will be manifest in his body. Lord, we pray for Vlad. Lord, we just pray for that deep healing. Lord, I just, the picture I saw was a wound that's been scabbed over that keeps getting picked on and and, and opened up again and opened up again. So Lord, I just pray that that wound will heal. Lord, that it will not get picked on 
but that you will just, you've got to call upon that man. I just pray that you will set him on a straight path, Lord. That he will just find that spot where he fits, Lord. But I just pray, that for, again, for that healing. Last week he asked me to be praying for his family. Uh, they're still in the Ukraine, Lord. I just pray that you, for your protection, your provision. Lord, we pray f for those that have suffered from COVID. Lord, we Keith and their church. Lord, this other church in the community that was ex it was, was plague that had come upon them again. Lord, I just thank you that you are a healer. Lord, your word shows, Lord, times when plagues came through the children of Israel and you raised up the snake on the... and whoever looked to, would be healed. Lord, so we just pray that that cross that was raised up, Lord, that as we look to that, that your people will be healed. That COVID will no longer be a plague upon this land. Lord, that COVID is under the blood. That all symptoms will be removed. Those that are still experiencing long COVID symptoms, we just again speak your word of your healing to them. Lord, it's so special to be able to come and know that we can stand upon your promises. So, Lord, it's not by works of righteousness that we've done, but Lord, but it's your mercies and your love that you demonstrated toward us. So we thank you and we just accept that healing and just pray that your word that comes forth in the rest of the service will just be alive in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, there's only a first Timothy and a second Timothy. So this is not third Timothy. So <laughs> no, nope, I'm Tiffany. Kind of sounds like Timothy. Okay. Just going to move some things over. So I asked the question, anybody hungry? I'm talking about for spiritual things. Always, that's a, that's good. So my sister and I and Britton and Joshua, it was a very unusual time. Our families were all different places and the combinations it was. Well, Trisha and I being together isn't unusual, but having Joshua and Britton, nobody else, it was just fun. It was different. But we went to Bellevue. We had an opportunity to go to a conference and the worship, powerful. It was heavenly. Okay, maybe not, but on the way there, right? <laughs> it was good. What, what's your word, Tricia? Heavenly. It really, I mean, people really entered in. I mean, I had an anticipation going just to be there. Uh, I mean, to me, I had a hunger. I wanted to be there. I was excited to get there. And I'm thankful that I did. So, Lord, I just pray this day that every person who's here, God, I pray that they would not just have a hunger, but that your word today would would not only satisfy, but also give them a thirst for more. God, you are the one who satisfies. You are the one thing in this world that um, your truth you are the way, you are life, and everything everything that you have in your heart for us all has to do with love, 
whether it's giving us commands, whether it's direction or correction or leading. God, your heart is that none should perish. God, may we keep in mind that your desire is for us to know you, to have a right relationship with you. And God, I pray this day that you would speak through me, Lord. Speak to me as, as I present your word, God. I thank you and I praise you for this opportunity, God. I pray that I would just not be seen, but it would be your word that would come forth. God, that maybe people would leave and say, they had a message from heaven, just like we left, and I, I use the word heavenly. God, I thank you that uh, when people gather to worship you, it's different than gathering for something else. God, we've come this day because we are hungry, because we're desiring to be strengthened. We're desiring to be healed. We're desiring to be set free from the world. God, may your light shine greatly during this time, Lord, and not just right now, but may this be just watering of seeds that have been previously planted or maybe planting of seeds of things that we've never heard or, God, just awaken us. Awaken places in us that may be dormant, that may be asleep, things that need to come alive, that things need to be revived. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I have a few key phrases. What did Jesus say if we don't praise? What's going to happen? Well, what was he telling the people back in his time? Even the, the rocks would cry out. I don't want rocks crying out in my place, do you? I mean, I want my voice known to him. Not, you know, like Tricia brought it up before. We've seen this. We've been in worship time with this church they've come up from florida they turn around they don't want to be worshiped they turn around to worship their creator so it's not on them you know pride is not where my heart ever wants to be so all for his glory there's that question that jesus asked his friends when he was in the garden getting ready to go do to go through the beating, the shame, the piercing, the poking, the prodding, the pulling out of his hair, the, the enduring of pain for us, going to the cross, being willing to give up his life in a brutal way because of love. So his friends, he and his friends had gathered and they had what they call the Last Supper. We're going to celebrate what we call communion we're, gonna, we're going to celebrate that. When Jesus presented it to his friends, he said, remember. Every time you do this, remember. He was getting ready. His body was going to be beaten and broken for us. His blood was shed for us. So the question that came to me this morning as I was thinking and preparing and pondering was, will you not sit with me for one hour? So I ask you the question today. Are you hungry today? I know I get antsy sometimes and I move around. But can I just challenge you today? If you have to go to the bathroom, if you need to go, go. You can go now if you need to go. But if you can, just, just wait on the Lord. Ask him to give you a quiet spirit, a spirit that really wants to hear whatever it is that he wants to speak to you directly. I don't know. I mean, he'll probably speak things to me as, I mean, I know he will. I know he will. Because as we come with the intention of worshiping him, with being fed by him, offering our sacrifice of worship to him, uh, you know, that's a friendship. That's a relationship. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. I mean, I can't walk in Timothy's shoes. He doesn't walk in mine. Nobody does. But the desire of the heart of the Father is that none should perish. And that his love, his great gift of love would be known to his creation. But he gives us choice. So, are you hungry? Are you willing to worship and just surrender whatever, whatever you came in with today? I've been, I'm tired. It's been a really busy couple of months. Not just days, it's been months. But you know what? God is the strength of our lives. 
And I get excited when it comes to talking about Jesus. So here we go. The other, next part, this morning. So my, my son, he'd gone out to go see if his friend wanted to go to church this afternoon. And I was calling him. I didn't have my glasses on. You guys know I can't see with my glasses on and I can't see with them off. I can see out there, but I have to take them off to read a lot of him. But I'd gone to the front door out on the porch and I saw a cross in the field. I know, I know there's trees in the field. And I saw some trees and they looked like people, but they weren't. They were trees. But that That scripture that came to me is where we're going to go. The story about a man who was blind. And, and, And when he met with Jesus, God did something, not just with his eyes. but There's all kinds of different points just in these few scripture verses. So let's all go to the book of John. Lord, I pray that as we read your word today... God, I pray that it wouldn't be just reading your word. God, I pray that we would be hearers and doers, that we'd apply it, that we'd allow you to wash us, that we'd allow you to restore us, to lead us, to touch us. God, open our spiritual ears to hear. Open our spiritual eyes to see how great you are. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, keep your finger there for just a second. I mean, I want to turn to one other, one other passage before. In Luke, some of you that have been here before have heard me that I pray that God's, God would heal my, my eyes, my physical eyes, so I wouldn't have to wear my glasses and I could see up close and see far away, but at this point, it hasn't been his will to do that, but that's okay. He knows. So, um, Luke 5, I'll just read this real quick. 5.17, but so much more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear, to be healed by him of their infirmities. Many people came to Jesus. Many people came to Jesus. And, um, healed people. He healed them. He restored them. He gave them strength. So back to our our John 8. And that is what we just, we've got to come to Jesus. We've got to come to Jesus. That's the thing. That's the one place that we should be going to. Not other things, not other people. Sometimes if somebody's going to give us godly counsel, that could guide us, yes. But not finding our satisfaction in people, in things, the things of this world. Okay, but here we go. So, just a second here. On eight. Nope, hold on. I'm not in the right spot. Let me find it real quick. It's Mark 8. Sorry, guys. It's Mark 8. Mark 8, verse 22. Okay, so there's, there's several different points in this. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to go back, and we're going to break it down. So here it goes. And he cometh to Bethsaida. So we're talking about Jesus. And they bring him, a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him. He asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. So some specific points. Okay, verse 22. He cometh to Bethsaida, so Jesus went there, and they bring him a blind man unto him. So 
they came specifically to Jesus. There must have been some faith there. Their point was they came, they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. They wanted, he wanted, they sought Jesus to do what they felt was this guy's need of having his sight restored, right? So that's where we need to do. We need to go to Jesus with faith. We need to ask him whatever our thing is. Ask him to heal us. Ask him to free us. Ask him to deliver us. Verse 23, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he'd spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and asked him if he saw aught. So basically, Jesus, what did he do? He took him by the hand. What does Jesus tell us to do? He says what? He says, come unto me. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you what? I'll give you rest for what? For your soul, your thought life, that place the battle rages so many days, that place this world goes on. He'll give you rest in your soul. What does it say in Psalm 23? It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Another version, I've said this before, it says quiet streams. Jesus is going to take us to a place not of chaos. Sometimes we do get into chaos, but he'll be with us during those times. So here, he took the blind man by the hand. He led him out of the town, so he took him to a specific place. And then it says, and when he had spit on his eyes, so Jesus spit on the guy's eyes, he placed something of himself upon the guy's situation. Jesus will apply, what is it that we need? Do we need our, uh, our hearts that are broken, healed, restored? Do we need our minds restored? Do we need our spirits restored? The Holy Spirit will come upon us. He will set the captives free. He will open blinded eyes. And it says, he, and he put hands on him. He touched him. So he spit in his eyes. He put hands upon him. And he asked him if he saw, do you see anything? He asked him, is anything happening yet? And then it says, and he looked up. And said, I see men as trees walking. I'm talking about looking up to God. Looking up to God. In church, I wanted to take a picture of it. I've noticed it the last two weeks. We usually sit up towards the left front. So let's say if we're sitting there, we're facing, in this corner there's a cross, and there's a light that shines like, shines up on the cross. And if you look up in the very far corner of the church, there's a shadow of the cross up in the high corner. I don't know. Have you noticed that, Diana? Look at that next time. So you look up and I see the cross. And oftentimes when we're worshiping, I feel led to go to the foot of the cross. We've said this before. What is it? Going to the foot of the cross, that's a place where we're all equal. It's a place where we can lay our burdens down and leave them. We can cast our care on the, on, at the feet of Jesus. Spending that time with Jesus is everything. Everything. Growing in his word, he's the living word. So it says, he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. So his, eye, his eyesight wasn't quite clear yet. And then it says, after he put his hands upon, again upon his eyes, there was a second touch from Jesus. He made him look up. So sometimes we have to keep going back to Jesus and look up. It says, and he was restored and he saw every man clearly. That's what Jesus will do for us. The blind man, the song, amazing grace. Grace, that thing, that gift that we don't deserve. That gift of Jesus saving grace. I once was lost. Now I'm found. I once was blind. Now I see. 
a touch from Jesus and coming back to Jesus again, looking up, looking up. That's where we got to go. So I think, I think, was it Tim alluded to it already? What did he say? If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus, like back that, that example back in the Old Testament, looking up to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. He's the one who's made us. He's the one who's created us. Okay, so now today I ask you, are you awake spiritually? Would you rather go take a nap? Sometimes I'd rather go take a nap. Sometimes I'd like to I'd sleep in a little bit longer. And I do. But truly, you get up early and you spend time with the Lord, the first thing you do, it's time well spent. It is time well spent. And what you'll realize, you spend five minutes, it's not enough. You'll want more. And then you'll get behind and you've got to get out the door because you've got to get where you're going. But truly, you spend five minutes with him, you're going to realize you need 50 minutes with him. But here's where I want to go. I want to go to the book of Revelation. What is the book of Revelation all about? Well, I'll read the verse, verse 1 of chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John. Okay, I'm going to skip up or over. I want to start with verse 17. If you have a Bible that has the words in red, those are words that Jesus spoke. So here it says in verse 17. And when I saw him, this is John, when I saw him, saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me. Jesus, what? What did he do again? Put his hand on him. He has his hand on his kids. His hand was on him. His right hand, that's right. He had his right hand upon me saying, what did he say? Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, I want to go down to verse 5, and then I'm going to back up. I just want you to focus and think about this verse 5. It says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. Okay, I'm going to back up now. Well, I'm, I should read it. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. There are things in our lives, if there, if there are things in our lives that need to be removed, if there are things that we are putting before the Lord and we know that we're putting them before the Lord, and we know that the Lord wants first place over these things. We're having other gods. And he is not a God that he should lie. His desire is that we are on fire for him. That we know him. That we desire to know him. That we live for him. And that we shine brightly for him. So back up. Verse, chapter 2 verse 1. Unto the church... Of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Okay, are you guys out doing the laboring? Are you working for the Lord? Okay, let's read it. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake, for my name's sake hath labored. You guys are out doing stuff for Jesus, right? And has not fainted. 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. If our first love is not Jesus, if there's a time in your life where you were closer to the Lord, you need to get back. It wasn't he that moved. So verse 5 again, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember where you were. Repent and do the first works. Using the analogy of a husband and wife. You know, in the beginning, what are they doing? They want to be together. They're together. They date. They're wanting to spend time together. They want to be together. They want to be together. They spend time together. They grow to know each other. They get married. And then what happens? Sometimes they what? They grow apart. They're not doing the first things that they did. But more importantly, our relationship with Heavenly Father, our relationship with Jesus, his desire, again, is that none should perish. And it is Jesus that will feed us. I was thinking, um, this morning in church, they were giving the illustration or sharing the story in Acts 11, Peter was repeating about how uh, there was a time where he had this vision, like a sheet had come down from heaven and, and God told him to arise, kill and eat, and these were unclean things, but truly what it was meaning is that the gospel was for everybody and that, that they were going to be taken to places that he wasn't really comfortable with. You know, there's people who don't really associate with certain people, you know. But people are people. God loves his creation. And we need to do the same. So he used that, that, that phrase, arise, kill, and eat. Well, there were many times, if, if you were here last week when I taught, what happened when Elijah, Elijah had just had this major God is God revelation to people. Ahab and Jezebel were having... Well, they were having a time because Elijah had said it's not going to rain. So what happens when it doesn't rain? There's a famine. And there was a famine in the land, and, and they, it, it wasn't well with them. But Elijah, he actually told Ahab, he said, eat. And then they went, and they had this moment up on Mount Carmel, and God proved that he was God by sending down the fire, burnt up the offerings of... So Elijah was waiting, and... This other group of false prophets, the ones that were worshiping Baal and didn't follow the true God, God sent fire down and consumed them, and then Elijah went and wiped them out. And then Elijah's like, the rain's coming. The rain's coming. Well then, Jezebel says he's gonna, she was going to do the same thing to Elijah, what Elijah had done to the false prophets. So he takes off and goes and hides. And while he's laying down, it's presented to him, arise, eat. Arise, eat. It's twice. There's going to be a journey. And where was he going? He was going to the mountain where he was going to meet with God. Life is a journey. But that food, that meal that was prepared for him when he woke up and that he was told to eat, it sustained him for 40 days to get to God. And God, it says, you know, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil and our cup will overflow. You just have to come to the table. In life, in life, We can come to Jesus in this life. We can be fed by him. Jesus defeated death. He defeated hell and the grave. He is alive. He's gone to prepare a place for us. He sent the Holy Spirit, our comforter, the one who brings to remembrance things that we've learned. And as you seek him, you're going to find. 
you're going to find what you're looking for. Just like the blind man, his friends brought him to Jesus. And Jesus did what he needed to do. So today, look up. Look up. Look up your story. Look up your subject matter. Look up to Jesus. This is truth. This is the word of God. This is meat. This is the living bread. He's the bread that came down from heaven. He'll supply just like he supplied manna. Just like he supplied the meat. Supplied the meat. Just like he supplies water. Our God is able to supply our every need. You just have to go to him. By faith. Ask. Let him take you where he needs to take you. Let him touch you. Let him tell you where to look and that's to him. He says, look unto me and be ye saved. So we're going to take communion. Tim and Diana are going to come up and help me with that. So I don't know where everyone's heart is, and I, you know, sometimes I don't even know where mine is. I, I do know that I love Jesus. I know that I'm saved. But there's times where, one point I, I forgot to mention, I wanted to tell you, don't be like Judas. Don't be a Judas that betrays our Savior. Don't be like the people who are one week on Palm Sunday waving their palm branches, laying down their coats, basically signifying Jesus and his royalty, saying, Hosanna, save us, and a, just a procession of excitement. And then the next week saying, crucify him. Go to him with faith, without doubting. Ask him to help your unbelief. If there are things in your life that you need freedom in, he is the answer. Rather than going and getting that next fix, go read your Bible. Go worship. Get down on your knees and just say, God, I thank you for healing me. I thank you for setting me free. The Bible tells us if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we'll be saved. If we invite the Holy Spirit to come in to all the other spirits, the demonic spirits, the tormenting spirits that oppress us or depress us or possess whatever it may be run to Jesus look up to him allow him to place something of himself in you on you and Lord be glorified so if you've never said yes to Jesus opportunity here anybody listening later on the video I want to give you that opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. And then we're going to do a communion. It's back here. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by his friend, Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus came to die, but he didn't stay dead. He had told his friends he was going to rise. He was going to rebuild the temple in three days. We are the temple of the living God if we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. He resides and he dwells in us and he will be with us and he will go before us and he'll take us and he'll lead us wherever it is that he has called us to go. His words are life. I want to read one more passage. It's in John 6. I know I've read this before, but I heard this read Actually, the pastor that spoke on Thursday, it was his dad that was reading this passage one day, and it just, it stuck with me. And I know I've read it to you guys, but it's so powerful. So, just a second. I'm going to start with 48. No, I'm going to start with 43. John 6, 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. I'm going to skip down. It says, I am that bread of life. I am the bread, verse 50, I, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof 
and not die if you partake of Jesus. Jesus is the key. He is the key to the kingdom. Verse 52, the Jews therefore, no, I, I need to read it. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. You know what? Maybe let's go pass out the elements right now, but please try to listen as I read. May, wait, let's just wait. Let's wait. I really want you guys to focus on this. If a man eat of this bread, he shall what? Live forever. Thanks, honey. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He gave his life that the world would not perish. It says, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. And it says these things, listen, this is key in here. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of the disciples, when they had heard it, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? This is a hard thing that he's saying. And then it says, And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there, is some, there are some of you that believe not. There are some of you that believe not. That's a sad thing. It says, for Jesus knew not from the, he knew, he, sorry, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. I'm getting there. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. Okay, this is a really sad part. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So these people that had seen him feed thousands of people, had seen him open people's blinded eyes, Heal leprous people. Heal lame people. Restore people who'd been bruised and battered. He gave them hope. People who were possessed by demons and cutting themselves and breaking chains. They, they, they couldn't even be bound because they were so possessed. But the thing was, these people came to Jesus and he healed them. And he provided for them. They saw these things. But the words that he spoke, what does it say? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also go away? Okay, now listen to this. Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternity. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you believe? Do you believe today? Are you sure? You've made your confession known. And it says, And Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. And he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For he it was that should betray him, being none of the twelve. So today, Lord, I ask that you would speak to us in areas of our lives where we're not trusting you, 
where we're denying you as our Lord, where we're betraying you. God, reveal to us the places where we need to repent. Reveal to us the places that we need to remember where we may once have been closer to you. God, restore that joy of our salvation. Strengthen us, Lord. With you, all things are possible. With you, nothing shall be impossible. God, I thank you for healing hurts. I thank you for taking blinders off of minds and eyes. God, may your spirit rule and reign. Now, I want to give an opportunity for people to say yes to Jesus today. If you have never said yes to Jesus, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. I already said it. You believe it in your heart. You confess it with your mouth that he is Lord. You'll be saved. And then with that, you just walk with him and let him lead you, and he will. So I'm going to pray you can repeat after me, dear God. I believe that Jesus is the true and living Son of God. Jesus, I believe you're God, and I want you to be my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. May I run to you. Nowhere else. I surrender my life this day. My body, my soul, my mind, my spirit. Holy Spirit, I invite you in. Eradicate every other demonic spirit. Those places that Satan has had a foothold or a stronghold, you are greater. And this day, I proclaim victory in you, Jesus. I thank you that you are the giver of life, and I receive that gift this day, September 3rd, 2023. I surrender it all. May I leave transformed, renewed, strengthened, healed, restored. I commit everything to you, God, from this day forward. May I hear your voice. May I not just hear it, but may I listen and obey right away. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Tim and Diana. in looking at communion <clears throat> and looking at Christ when they took the bread when he broke it and he s said this is my body that's broken for you and there's another scripture that talks about none of Jesus' bones were broken. And for years, I kind of fought with that, going, how could he not be broken, but be broken? And we see that he was, the analogy that he was using was the bread that was Looking at the bread, Jesus said, oh, okay. in John 6, starting with 47, it says, Verily I, verily I believe, to, I say to you, he that believeth in me has everlasting life. He said, I am the bread of life. Your father said, eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. 
If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And when we saw the feeding of the 5,000, he took the bread and he broke it. And he took those five loaves and it fed 5,000 people. And there were leftovers. That bread was sufficient to meet the needs of all the people and more than enough. And as we take the bread, we think, this is Christ's body broken for us. And as when he fed the multitude, the bread that he broke was enough for all. And he said, I give my life for the world. I give my flesh. So in taking this, we're saying, I'm not just going to set my cracker on the corner. I'm going to eat it. And as we consume it, it becomes part of us. So, in taking the bread and breaking and eating, we're eating that life that Jesus gave for all. So take the bread, do this in remembrance of Christ. In Jesus' name. Revelations 12 10 and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying this is John that heard the voice and he said now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night and they overcame him because of the blood his blood on that cross and the rest of the verse is because of the word of their testimony which means do it again and they did not love their lives unto death Lord we just take this cup now and we thank you that your blood is life your blood is eternal life it never died it lives on and Lord your blood it cleanses us it protects us, it heals us. God, we thank you that all the life of Christ is blessed right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to worship some more now. Testing. Testing. 
guys want to stand, we're going to sing Spirit of the Living God. We only want to hear his voice, amen. Every other voice be silenced. Some of these songs that we're singing today, some of them are a little bit older songs, but they're quite worshipful songs. Not all of them. Let's just do it. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear
God, may your voice be the one that we speak or that, that we hear and may we speak your word too. It's in those quiet places when we're intentional about getting with the Lord. When you're intentional about doing something and you've got a passion and a drive behind it, it can be pretty exciting to get there, right? So, just go to Jesus.
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The lambs of God. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The lambs of God. you we praise you you are worthy of all of our praise and we thank you we thank you for the cross thank you for the cross Thank you for the price you gave, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came, you gave amazing grace. Thank you for the love, Thank you for the name. for us, Lord. We thank you that you came, you died, but not only did you die, you rose, and you are alive, and you're coming back. Just sing this little chorus here.
Thank you. You're going to sing? She's going to sing. Thank you, guys. Okay. While they go sit, if everybody could just close their eyes just for a moment. Um, some of the things that the worship team can go sit down. And one thing that um, we learned in this class that we were taking this last week from people that I would say walk in a spiritual maturity is uh, to steward your heart when you sing. It would be kind of like when you're praying is, and when you're singing, it would be like when you're talking on the phone with someone and they're not really paying attention, but they can still talk to you, but they're not really paying attention. They can say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then you'd, and you would say, did you hear what I said? And they'll go, oh, no, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. And one part of spiritual maturity is uh, to, to take your heart and engage it with the words that you're hearing and see God judges you by the intent of your heart and that relationship that you have with him is of the spirit which you welcome him in your heart and that's where you don't want to pray without having your heart engaged you don't want to sing without having your heart engaged this is now your relationship with him so you're not just repeating a prayer you're actually saying God I'm bringing the, my heart before you and then when he speaks to you that is seed and then to steward that seed until it comes into fruitfulness so there's there's life that can come from you stewarding your heart when you sing you can sing these songs and not be present is that fair to say so as you begin to go to church and as it says those who have ears to hear let him speak to you you're going to have to disconnect from the distractions of your imagination the distractions of the, the the going on around you and steward your heart say god i'm here it might not be as powerful or the glory might not be as strong in a place but you can begin to bring in the atmosphere of god's presence of god's kingdom by you stewarding your own heart to saying, God, we welcome you. So I'm going to sing this song, but I want you to steward your heart <clears throat> and saying, God, I'm going to listen to the words and I'm going to sing these songs. I'm going to sing these words back to you. And I'm going to take them and may they bring glory to the King of glory. May they bring glory to you. I'm going to take them. I'm going to and I want to offer up praise and I want to say thank you. So begin to do that. And when you begin to engage in him, you begin to see that the power of the Holy Spirit will come. He doesn't, he's there, but he inhabits, his, he inhabits the praises of people. He knows when he's welcome. So steward your heart, close your eyes. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the cross and the price you paid to forgive me and redeem me. Just take a minute and wait on him. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price that you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now I know your forgiveness and Victorious. 
just thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the cross. Do you find that helpful? Is that helpful? You know, part of discipleship on our journey with intimacy with the Lord is to set our affection on things above, not on things of this earth. And when you begin to set your affection on things of this earth, when you are around people, kingdom people, king, people that have a, a hunger for the Lord, they walk in an intimacy that you don't know of, that you don't know until you see it in a person's life, and then you begin to appreciate it. And it's one of those things where you're almost like, God, I, 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 want, to, I want you to do that in me. I want to know you like that. And, and that was something that was, I mean, I've, I've seen it before. I think the first time that we'd ever gone to a, a worship, it was not a concert. Typically when people go to a church concert, it's different than when somebody's setting their affection on Jesus and they just want Jesus to show up. They want Jesus to come and be who he says he is, and he comes, and people get healed, and they get transformed. Um, so yesterday, um, I almost cried when, because they don't tell you who typically is coming. Like, they don't tell you who's teaching. And um, they announced that Benny Hinn was coming. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I started to cry, because he's a friend of God. And when you're around somebody who doesn't play church, when you have a need, God uses all kinds of people. But when you know somebody is a friend of God, it's a, it, they, they walk in. I'm not saying that they're perfect. I'm not saying that their heart is. The, your heart always, always has to be governed by the Lord. But there's this intimacy that they know the Lord in differently. And you begin to appreciate that. So there's a, the people that they, they want to glorify God. They want to bring glory to the King of Kings. Um, you know the song, King of Glory, Majesty. You know the song that we sing? Well, he's the King of Glory. And if he's the King of Glory and his glory comes on a person's life and the anointing comes, that anointing comes to break off yokes off of people's lives. So when Benny spoke... He talked about all the experiences, the neat miracles that he has seen, but he wanted to tell people that it does not matter how many miracles that you have seen. It's not your experience that defeats the devil. It's his word. You have to know his word. And he gave the, and I'll probably talk on it next week, he said divinity and deity. When he was younger, all the greats were around. Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman, all of these people that were there, they knew that when they said divinity, uh, they meant deity. But now, because of this darkness that's coming in, when you think of divinity, oh, they're divine. They've got all of these different qualities, and there's all this spiritual stuff that's coming in. And so he's saying the deity, Satan will attack the deity. So you need to know who God says. God said, my name is, say, I am. I am life. I am light. I am the way. I am. Satan always says, I have, and I'll give it to you what I have. And he said that Jesus, God, Jesus is God, and he said, I am that I am. I am light. I am the life. I am the light of the world. And so he gives this, God is omnipotent. Satan is not. He's not all powerful. He submits. He says you can resist him, and he will flee. That's what God's word tells us. And so he's not omnipotent, but God is. Satan isn't. God is. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. And, and so he gave us this list. You have to know who God is and the authority that, of God's word. You overcome, Tiffany gave it today, by the blood and the word of our testimony. Our testimony needs to become Jesus. You are who you say you are. If you're up against Satan, it's not about your smut story. Your testimony becomes Jesus and Jesus and his power and authority, and it becomes about Jesus. Your testimony needs to go not about you anymore. It's going to be about him now. It's going to shift focus. It becomes about him. 
Because when the Lord redeems you at the cross, the enemy will always ha- harass you. And the enemy just himself feels like shame. So if you feel in shame, he's just, the devil's just near you. But when, when you are redeemed in him, you begin to go on a different journey. And in discipleship, you have to know you're going to suffer differently. And so in the sufferings of Christ, the Bible says not to, not to freak out. Because even Paul said that there was given a thorn in his flesh. And I agree with a lot of the schools of thought in regards to, I don't believe that it was his eyesight. I don't believe that it was the devil, a devil. It was there to buffet him so he would always trust, I need you, God. I need you, God. There's the devil. I need you, God. I need you to come. I need you to come with your power. I need you. I need your strength. I need your wisdom, and I'm going to wait on you. And so he had this understanding. And so these divine revelations that are given unto us, there's the, it's something called the manifold wisdom of God. And so when we go through these seasons in your life, I have a picture for everybody. Let's see if I can do it really fast. And I believe that it will help us to endure some things that you're going to go through that may be a bit crazy. So we have Exodus. Who's heard of Exodus? They get let out of Exodus, right? What's the first big thing that they have to go through? The what? Not yet. Almost. The Red Sea. And then, and then who said the next one? The what? The wilderness. Okay. So they're, they're in the wilderness. They did not need to be in the wilderness for very long, but they were in the wilderness for a long time, for 40 years. Now they're going to go through the end of that 40 years. God's going to raise up Joshua, and they're going to have to cross the Jordan River. And when you cross over the Jordan River, the manna, that you ate in the wilderness, God provided. He got you out. He brought you in to lead you. You have to learn how not to complain. You have to learn what God wants you to learn. You have to learn to stop going around the same, I have to say this, stupid mountain, uh, get around again and again. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 1.9, it says, get off the mountain, now go. Get, stop going around the same thing. You're going to have to learn to obey him. And when you learn to obey him, you're going to cross another river. You're going to go through some first Peter thing that God says when something crazy happens it's okay it's just part of it's part of his plan it's part of you being rooted in him there's a a shift it's similar to the red right before the Red Sea there was crazy there were crazy things that happened before he led them out to get them to go and be let out of their sin anybody had crazy stuff happen before you got like got to the place where you're let out of your sin okay Now you're in the wilderness. Now some of you are getting to the place. It does not need to take you 40 years. Maturing, though, will be your whole lifetime. But when you receive Jesus as your Savior, you begin to go towards him. Now on the other side of the Jordan is where you're going to learn about the inheritance. You're going to learn to inherit his kingdom. And it will come. And his will be done on earth. Okay, now there's steps. The first battle that they're going to come across right before, there's some maturity that we're going to see that's going to happen in Joshua's life. Because on this side, Joshua was on this side of the Jordan River. He had, he had already heard God's voice, instructed him what to do. And then what's going to happen? The things that were familiar with him about the Lord are now going to be different because on this side, he had manna. On this side, he was no longer going to have manna. He was going to begin to eat the fruit of the land. And it, with that means that there was a lot of inheritance, and he was going to have to go through these strategic battles listening to the Lord. These are going to be the battles for inheritance. Okay? And in those battles, some of those places of inheritance have giants. Demonic strongholds, things that you're going to come up against that you never, ever understood. But when you go through them and you, and the, you allow the Lord to bring you into victory, in maturity, some of these you're going to get pummeled in, but the Lord is merciful. He will lead you through them. 
And even if you make a mistake, he will allow you, because of his mercy, this is not your sin story. Now this is about God. I don't know, I'm not going back, but I don't know what to do here. And you will begin to listen to the Lord more than you have ever listened. I'm going to put this as a battle, and you're going to have ears to hear, because you're going to be willing to hear. Ears to hear. And we're going to go through a couple of these battles, and we're going to learn about how they were inheriting the land. This was their inheritance. Hey. All right. Okay, here we go. You guys ready? We're going to start off with about being wise and being foolish. We've got, in the scriptures, we have the foolish man and the wise man building their what? What's going to come down? storms okay we've got a wise bride and foolish what some had their oils on some didn't we have obedient prophets and we have the false prophets you're going to learn that's all part of learning it's all part of growing up in the kingdom and we have got some to learn some of these kingdom strategies i'm going to try to go as fast as i can through this just really fast you guys because i know for sake of time but this i pray that this will be fast but it will be with authority and it will be really mature and and it will be meet you right where you're at how about that okay here we go let me get where i'm at let's go to um james chapter one hebrews james okay so here we go we're going to cross you're going to come to a place and I'm going to tell you, you're, you're going to know when you hit a Jordan River. Did, did you guys know that you left Egypt? Can that, does that make sense in your heart? Okay. So you're going to come to a position where your God is, your God, you're, you're, hearing, you're hearing what is right and what is wrong right now. But there will be a place where in your heart you will be circumcised in your heart. And when, you walk, and, when, and when you get into the circumcision of your heart, you're willing to listen to him. You have crossed into the Jordan River, over to the Jordan River. Your heart is passed through. Your heart has been circumcised. Now you're this, in this maturing in the, in the discipleship in your heart. Not just outward, now inward, where you're, it doesn't matter how boring a church service is. You're being fed because you're saying, Holy Spirit, your word is speaking, so speak to me. You could be in a loud, amazing worship season, worship place, a worshipful place where God's glory is coming, and you can sense that your ears are, are not hearing the Lord, and you go, Lord, I want to hear you. So either way, you would uh, begin to grow that you can hear the voice of the Lord, and he's going to lead you. But here is a season where you begin to go through a trial, and it's crazy, and you don't know what to do. And that's exactly what it was like when Joshua was going in, and he had to learn how to battle. He never learned how to battle. He's been a slave. They were, they were in slavery, leading people that were at slavery into not complaining, and then into an inheritance is a whole different transition they, he, was, he was raised up around people who had come out of slavery. So he was learning as we were learning. So there were some people that came out of Egypt who had been in Egypt. There were some people who were born in the wilderness. And there were some people who now were not going to go into this promised land. And there were a group of people who were. But my point today is when you get into this Jordan River experience and you begin to say, God, there's a battle ahead. You're saying that we're going to inherit some things back that I never thought I could receive back. Didn't even know I could go after you for things in the spiritual realm and make them manifest in the physical realm. I didn't know you could do that, but God, this is crazy and I don't know what to do. And God's like, okay, if you will listen to me, we'll get through this together and I will be with you, with you. Okay, here we go. My brother encountered all a joy when you fall into a diverse temptation, a crazy trial. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith is going to produce patience. Where you were quick before, you're not going to be quick now. Quick to make dumb choices. You're going to be not quick to have death come out of your mouth. You're going to be wise. 
You're going to have life come out of your. Now, this pressure in this season is going to is not going to squeeze out the bad. It's going to wash out the bad, and you're going to choose in your heart to trust what comes out of your mouth. That's wise. You have to teach your mouth how to speak because what you speak, you're going to plant a seed in this new season in your life. So knowing this, that the trying of your faith, it's going to work patience. And you need to let patience have its perfect work. You need to let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing other than to honor the king of kings, the king of glory, knowing that there's life in your tongue or death. You're going to speak life. And if any of you lack wisdom, you need to ask God, who will give men liberally, uh, upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You're going to say, God, I don't understand. I know you do. And I'm believing you for the very first time in this area, in this battle, in this craziness that you're going to give me wisdom. Amen? I mean, so be it. Yes, he will. But let him ask in faith, and you're not going to waver. You can recognize wavering coming. You can recognize it, but you're going to choose not to operate in it. You're going to say, I'm going to choose faith over fear. I'm going to, if you can recognize fear, he says, be not afraid of sudden fear. So you're going to recognize, I'm going to choose faith. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea and with the wind and you're tossed. So you're not going to go there. You're going to recognize it if you need to. For let not that man think he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So you don't want to be unstable in your mind. You want to be in his mind, in the right mind, in the mind of Christ. If you need to speak scripture and you say, I can hear those thoughts. I'm going to cast them down, pop them like a balloon. I'm going to turn my affection towards the king and I'm going to let him speak to me. I'm going to let him lead me. So you push your, you don't let your feelings lead you. You need to let his word lead you. He goes in front of that. He goes in front of your, of your feelings. He needs to lead you in spirit and in truth. So let the brother of low degree rejoice that you're being exalted. So when you're being crushed, you're actually inside of you growing in his glory. It, it, there's a power that when you're crushed, when you don't understand the trial in patience, it's like seed and it's working in you. And if patience is like a seed, it goes through a death. And then the Bible says, if a seed doesn't die, it's going to remain alone. But if it does die, it begins to bear fruit and it's season. So you need to let this season happen. You you need to know that that just like an apple tree doesn't produce the next day but it does produce you need to go through the season you have to understand you're you're going to be in a season but if you're rich i'm going to say this if you're prideful you're going to be he in that he is made low if you're pri- let him let get you low get low let him humble you because as the flower of the grass he will pass away For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also the rich man, this prideful person, will fade away in his ways. But what you do in the kingdom will not not rust. You're, You're storing up treasure when you trust the Lord. When you pray and when you magnify his name, that's storing up treasure. And you become, what I heard the Lord say, is spiritually rich on the inside. And it's, the, it's this relationship with the Lord. And it, a lot of times it comes through a suffering in an area, a trial like this, of inheritance. You're inheriting, but it's like a crushing. It's a crazy, but it's amazing. And it brings glory to the Lord. So as you go through this, Blessed is the man that endures this trial, this temptation. For when you are tried, you will receive the crown of life. Okay, let's go there for a second. Everybody put your crown of life on. In that crushing, in that pressing, what's coming out of your mouth is you're actually, you're picking up your cross, you're dying, and what's coming out of your mouth is life. And when life gets spoken out of your mouth, it produces life. Life produces 
life. And it goes and it accomplishes that which it's sent to accomplish. So you've been given this, this crown of life that the Lord is going to use in, in your life. And there's wisdom in that. There's revelation knowledge in that crown. There's authority that comes with a crown, which the Lord promised to them that love him. So, but when, you, when you're tempted, don't say that you're tempted of God. Remember what Jesus said, um, Peter, I love you basically. But Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I'm praying for you. Remember, he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he says, I'm interceding for you. So when you pray, it's going up and, it's, and he's, he's praying with you. And so here we see this. Now you're needing him. And with God, nothing shall be impossible. You'll begin to see that impossible possible become possible because now you're needing him and so you're you're aware that this temptation this trial that you're going through the lord is going to expose some things inside of your life and for god cannot tempt you with evil so make sure that you're you're not speaking that because the enemy will love to to twist so you need to let word be the authority but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed so you have to understand, you have to submit to the Lord. This lust or this enticement is, is, is there's a maturity in making choices when you're tempted. Now, you know that God always says he makes a way of escape. And when you have that crown of life on and in this suffering because you're doing it with him, you're going to say like, oh, God, I didn't know that was the door of escape. I can hear it now. Or you'll see it in the spiritual realm. I didn't know that was there before. Nobody else can hear that. Jeremy, nobody else hears that, but you're like being crushed and pressed, and you hear it. And God's like, did you hear that? And he's like, yeah, that's your door of escape. Go, look for the way out. And you look, and you leave. And did you guys hear all that, Nordog? And everybody be like, no, I didn't hear it. And Jeremy's like, it was so loud. I heard it. And now God's showing you the way of escape intimately because you're running the race with him in a relationship, not apart from him. So he says, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and it comes down from the Father of lights. So he, it's coming down. It's coming down. Verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you go through this trial, you need to learn to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Yes, slow to speak. Well, I'm quick to speak. Not anymore. You're going to speak life. You're in the crushing. You're going to be willing to listen to him. Slow to become angry. For the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. You need to listen to him. Listen to him. Verse 25. But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, keep going back to the word. Let it, the word lead you and continue therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, you need to begin to not be. You need to steward the word that he gives to you. Set your affection on his word. And if you don't know if God speaks through the word, you just go, God, I must believe that you're going to speak through the word. And he will speak through the word. Raise your hand if you know he will speak through his word. Okay, he will speak through his word. But a doer of the work, be not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. There's a work going on. This man will be blessed in his deed. So here we're going to go really fast. We're going to go to Joshua's life. Joshua chapter, I think it's the end of four, really fast. We're going to go through really fast these battles and what he had to spiritually learn in leading and people to inherit he never inherited before he got a job position and he's going to grow god's going to grow him up really fast so do you have to stay 40 years in the wilderness like moses had to no you don't okay let's read chapter five or chapter 4, the end of it, starting with verse 16 to 14. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spake unto Joshua. So he's hearing from the Lord. Okay, everybody point to your ears. He's hearing from the Lord. We're going to see him go into a different understanding of the Lord, though, here pretty soon when he crosses the Jordan, over, over the Jordan. So command the priests that they bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come up out of the Jordan. 
And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned into their place. So there was this parting of the of the um, Jordan River, just like it was in the Red Sea. And it flowed all of the banks as they did before. And the Lord came out, and the Lord and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped in Gilgal. Verse 22. Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel, come over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know that my hand of the know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Okay, so when you begin to see the hand of the Lord, it's very different than when you just were just walk like believing that you just go to church and the church is just you know thing that you do on sunday when you begin to see the hand of god things get to change a whole lot differently your whole life begins to change so here we see that he heard the voice of the lord and now we're in chapter five and it came to pass when all the kings of the amorites were on the side of the jordan westward and all the kings of the canaanites and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were uh, passed over, that their heart melted. So the people around them um, were kind of freaked out a little bit. And the time of the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. So they have first group that were out there in the wilderness and now, uh, came out of Egypt. And now there's this, this group. And Joshua made him that had not been circumcised. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt were, that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised. But all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt that they had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. Verse 7. And their children whom he raised up instead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them by the way. So it's a circumcision of the heart. You take this spiritual now. In your heart, there's a circumcision that went on. There's this willingness in your heart that's different now, when you're going through a circumcision, it is not, I would not say that that would be easy. It will not be spiritually easy when you go through the, the Jordan. And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. You have to let God know that God, this hurts, but I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to to allow you to do whatever you want to do with my life and in my heart and in this suffering. Most people don't want to suffer. They just go right back. They just head right back into Egypt. But this is a willingness now. Your heart is really willing. The Lord is showing his hand and you're obeying his voice. And now there's a circumcision of the heart. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Okay, this is not your sin story anymore. I've re re rolled away the reproach of Egypt off of you. Wherefore, the name of this place is Gilgal. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover during that time. Let's go on down. Verse 12. And the manna stopped. Now, they were used to for 40 years living off of manna. They were used to that kind of relationship with God providing. Now, they're in a whole new season and this is what he says. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore. They didn't have manna anymore. This was a whole different spiritual awakening in their life that they never operated in before. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of the Canaanite that year. Now listen, he's used to hearing God. Now watch what happens to Joshua. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold there stood a man over against him with a sword so he sees this guy with a sword in his hand Joshua went unto him and he said art thou for us or for our adversaries and he said nay 
But as a captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and he worshipped. You see Joshua here fall on his face and worship. What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy feet, for this place thereon where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So we have this, this transfer of he's leading these people. He's hearing God's voice. He gets into this position where now God tells him to circumcise the people. So there's a painful situation that happens right after this amazing, crazy parting of this Red Sea or parting of the Jordan. They get circumcised in their heart. He's heard God's voice before because God's leading him. But now he recognized like there's an angel army that's there. Has anybody ever seen an angel army before you that would kind of waken you up a bit more than where he walked intimately with the Lord? Now he's worshiping him. Verse 6, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. So there's a city that they're going to go after. And in Jericho, God is going to intimately, we're going to cruise through this part. Um, God intimately was going to tell him, Jericho, I'm, I'm going to give to you. But you're going to have to listen to me. You're going to blow the trumpet. You're going to blow, you're going you're gonna to walk around it so many times. You're going to do it this way. You're going to do it the way that I've instructed you. And this is what I want you to do. And Joshua obeyed. And verse 16, And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Now shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And when they shouted, Now God's way is not your way. If you're in your living room and the Lord begins to tell you to begin to praise my name, because of this intimacy, your circumcision of the heart, you don't understand, but you're just doing it out of obedience. And you begin to shout, praises unto the Lord, and the Lord begins to drop in the spiritual realm strongholds around people, and you and it's not your way, it's his way. And he will begin to show you his ways and how he can drop a city and drop a nation. And so he tells him to shout, and the city and the city shall be accursed, even it it and all that are thereon. Only Rahab the harlot is there. She and her family in the house, because she hid the messengers, was sent. Only they will be saved. And ye, in any wise, do not keep for yourself any accursed thing. Nothing. Don't have it in your home. Don't bring it with you. Don't bring the accursed thing into the camp. It'll bring a curse on my people who you are living with. If you've got strongholds in your house, there's something in your house. It has legal right there. If there's something going on, if you brought it hidden, there's a curse that comes on the house. And you are called to get the leaven out and put the blood on the door. And so if there's a stronghold inside of your house of chaos, there's a curse in the house. You see it here. We see that these people were told what to do. They, they did what God said. There was an instruction. They obeyed. They, the walls came down. But then there was a man named Achan. Achan took of the accursed thing. Now, the walls came down, so the sin happened at the end when the walls dropped down. So when you drop a wall, you have to make sure that you are not sinning. Because now you're in a shift of a new season, of a new inheritance. So what happens is they got that victory. They got this first victory. They got to see God's hand. God told them not to take, not to take anything. But then God says, okay, I'm going to give you AI. And so they're going to go to this next, this, next, this next season, this next shift, this next, it's almost like a breakthrough. And when you go to that next one, and all of a sudden you can't get victory. And, and he's like, what in the world? There's not even hardly any of these people. Like this last, there's bigger, what, what's going on? And, and, and Israel has sinned. They have trespassed. The Lord said to, to Joshua, they couldn't get this victory. And he said, get up, wherefore? Israel has sinned, and they've trespassed my covenant. I commanded them, for they have taken of the accursed thing, and they, they have also stolen and disassembled also, and they've put it even among their stuff. So they couldn't get the next victory. So what can we learn from that spiritually? Is there could be sin in the camp, or there's sin in your own life, and it needs to be dealt with. You need to always watch yourself. Always check your heart. Because they are cursed, neither will I be with you anymore except you destroy 
the cursed thing. You cannot get the victory until you get rid of the cursed thing from among you. Up, he says, sanctify the people, cleanse them, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there isn't a cursed thing in the midst of thee. Now, how does he know that? Because he hears the Lord. Uh, usually a prophetic person, the Bible says anyone desire to prophesy because the Lord can reveal that to you. Why does he expose sin? To get people free. It is not to be a jerk. It is not to be a turd. It is not to boast. It is to get people free. So if the Lord begins to reveal dreams, if the Lord begins to show you and begins to show you an, a hovering over somebody's home and the sin in their home, it is say, God, what do you want me to do next? I want you to go give them the warning or I just want you to pray for them. I'm going to send somebody else, but I want you to begin praying that God would expose it to them. Or he might just say, I just want you to pray. And when you pray, your prayers go and they go get answered. And I'm going to go deliver them. I'm going to use a situation in their life and I'm going to show them. And I'm going to tell you guys a, a cool testimony here in just a second. And so here they had to learn. They were learning as they were hearing as well on their journey that they had to get rid of some cursed things. And if God tells you to go in, you're going to do this. Don't take from it. Don't take from it. And if he says, I only want you to take the sheep and the, and the cattle but, or and the gold, I want you to do that. But listen to what he says. There was a house next door to ours. The people were crazy demon people and I set up a cross they set up a seance center which is really cool because I took a picture of their seance stuff with their like skulls and things and my cross was glowing on their window and so when I took the picture uh, I saw the the cross in front of their seance stuff and she'd walk around like a like her house like, go outside, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, you're going to have to help me because then I go to church, and the churches were celebrating Halloween. I'm like, I got witches on all sides of me. I'm like, felt like Elijah, the prophet, like, you guys got to get this stuff out of the churches because I got the real deal living all around me, you guys. This is not even funny. So when they left, so the owner that built our house also built that house. So we bought our house from him, and he still owned that house, and I'm like, they left? But um, they were witchcraft, witchy, witchy, demon people. And, and he's like, I was like, can I turn on worship music in there? And I heard God say, don't take anything from them, nothing. They left everything, left everything in their house, three-story house, left it all. And that's what the enemy does. He's just this, he just causes confusion and chaos and crazy. And, and that's where their mind was. And they had great jobs. They could live at home and work at home. And so the enemy had them, and, and, and God told me, don't, when you clean out their house, so I put everything outside the house, prayed as much as I knew, understood to pray at that time, and, I, and we prayed worship music on that house and all around our home, and, and I put everything out for free. So if you took something from somebody's house and you got a cursed thing, it could be that you got something from that free thing. So you just want to say, I rebuked the curse off of that thing because it did say free, it didn't say stolen. And, and okay, so this is the next thing, though. This is where you have to go with this. The next thing is that God said, I'm going to give you AI, and I, and, I, and I am going to give it to you this time. And I'm going to go, and I want you to go after this, and I want you to listen to me. And he begins to tell them certain things that they can and that they cannot do. Uh, um, but they were going to have to learn. I'm going to go to chapter 9 really fast because we're going to get there. They had to learn in the next season that these, these people actually saw what they were doing. And so they were going to, they were like, let's pretend that we are from really far away so they don't destroy us. Because look, their God parted the water for them and, and they're like taking over Jericho. And so there's this next group. They come in and they actually lie to them. Okay, so this third group right here comes in and they learn this is something you have to learn. That there's going to be liars that are going to deceive you on purpose. Just telling you. So they come and they lie. And the Bible says that they actually did not ask of the Lord about these people. Do they make a treaty together? Yeah, we won't knock you off. We won't, we won't take you out. They didn't even ask of the Lord. So then these other kingdoms that were around saw that they made an allegiance to these people. And somehow, they, somehow God's people found out that they lied because, you know, the truth always gets revealed. They're like, you lied to us, so you need to come and serve us, and you're going to have to do these certain things and, and, and come. And, 
So they had to learn that these people lied to them. So they needed to learn that they needed to ask the Lord constantly. So if you go to a garage sale, you need to probably ask the Lord, and especially as the days get darker, should I buy that thing or should I not buy that thing? Should I pray over that thing? I don't know where that thing's been, right? I need to be praying and asking the Lord, even little simple things. So then the next thing that they had to learn was that these five kings got together and they started to come against, remember the, the lying group that lied to them? So now you're going to have to learn that sometimes you're going to have to go to war lied to you like God has never lied. has anyone ever had to help somebody who's hurt them because the enemy got bigger to kill them and now you're in this position where oh well, I gotta I can't knock them off but now they've got an enemy and now I have to so God's always growing your heart with inheriting and now we have these people that are coming against these people so they had to learn to discern they didn't they didn't discern. They only learned that they needed to discern. And we're going to end it with chapter 5, and then I'll tell you guys a story. So chapter 10. Now it came to pass when the Adelzadek, the king of Jerusalem, had learned, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and the king, and he had done to Ai and the king, how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel, and the Gibeonites were the liars. And they were among them, so they thought they could see that they were friends now that they had feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai, and then they took out Ai. So now they're all getting concerned. And all of the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, as Jeshadak, the king of Jerusalem, sent Ahoam, the king of Hebron, unto Param, the king of Jemuth, and unto the Japheth, the king, so these five kings, come up unto me, he says, come and help me that we might smite the Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. So now you're going to find out that you're going to be fighting people you never thought that you were going to be fighting before, spiritually speaking. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jumath, the king of Lashith, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, and they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon, and they made war against it. And the men of Gibeon, these are the liars that they made a treaty with because they didn't ask God, but they're going to learn, right, that they needed to ask the Lord things. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of the Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servant. Come, help us, quickly, save us, help us. Uh, do you like that, hearing that from people who just lied to you? Like, will you please help me? I mean, it's a position of your, of your what? Of your heart that dwell in the mountains, and they're gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men. And the Lord speaks to him and tells him what to do. Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. What did he get? He got confirmation from who? From God. There shall not be a man of them that stands before thee. So Joshua therefore came to them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And continuing on this is a really cool thing so the lord in verse um verse 11 and it came to pass as they fled from israel that they were going down now this is how god uses the natural he began to throw down stones from heaven what do we call those hailstones that they whom the children of israel slew with the sword now listen to what joshua understands everybody say perceive hey so first He's learning, he's learning, he's learning he needs to discern, he's learning he needs to ask the Lord. Now he's seeing God, how God uses the natural things like the rain, the wind, the fire, the hailstones to fight the victory. Now listen to what everybody points to your mouth and say what Joshua's learning is a, his own authority that God has given to him. Listen to this. So we've got the hailstones that are coming down. Then Joshua, or then spake Joshua. So Joshua opens his mouth because God already told him that you're going to get the victory. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in that day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. So I'm like, did God say that or did Joshua say that? So it keeps going and it tells us. And the sun stopped. God caused it to hail, and it caused Joshua Joshua to realize, I can have authority over that. I can speak. Son, stop. 
And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It is not written in the book of Jasher. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. Isn't that so cool? So he's learning about the authority that we have in the Lord. Okay. So when we go to this conference, all of that to say that we're on a journey of victory. We're learning how to battle. We're learning how to inherit. We're learning to listen. We're learning to discern. We're learning to ask the Lord everything. And you're, you're growing. So at the conference, when Benny Hen, um, he was praying, and he wanted everyone, you know how he sings, Alleluia, Alleluia. And he had people raise their hands. And he said, begin praying in your prayer language and just begin to receive your healing. Just you receive the healing. And he said, I'm, uh, the, uh, the office that God has given to me, I'm going to operate in that, and I'm going to begin to rebuke things. And he began to rebuke this and rebuke the, the hearing and, uh, of the ears and a back pain. And he began to rebuke things. And he just said, things that I haven't done just or spoken, you just begin to receive your healing. And then he said, and if anybody has, we kept worshiping, and he said, if anybody's received any healing, just go to the side over there, and we'll have you over there. So in Benny, what I am doing is I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the power of the Lord in my own way off I'm on this back end corner. And God already showed me, just so you back seaters that like to sit in the back, you're not unnoticed by the Lord. I mean, you can hide all you want, but God's power can go in the back room. So, so anyway, I, I was back there, and I was, like, watching Benny because I wanted to be able to hear. I wanted to watch him because I knew he walked in an intimacy with God where he could hear God in, as he's ministering to God and ministering to his people. So people were lining up on the other side, and people were manifesting, and, and he likes people to be quiet even when they're manifesting. I mean, he likes it to be holy. He likes holy. And so, so the people came up, and this older guy comes up. He's 87 years old, and his ear popped open. So they brought him up there. And so the older guy, and there were two big, like, football player guys that were behind them. And the guy, I mean, they, they touched him. He touched him, and he fell down. They brought him back up again. He touched him. He fell down. He brought him back up again. And he moved a little bit. And he went to, he went to go, um, he moved a little bit, and Benny, the power of God was so strong on him, he act, actually touched the other guys. So the old guy went, not fall over, he flew over, and the other two went, like, crisscross the other way. And so they, when they got up, they went over and got the guy, and they picked him up, and he had this red face with a ginormous smile, he was 87 years old, with a ginormous, joyful smile on him. So Benny was going to pray for him one time, one more time. And the guy actually reached out to Benny, and Benny jumped back, and he goes, no. He goes, you can't touch me. The guy, he goes, I don't know why people want to reach out to me. I have to release the power. I, he has to, re it's like electricity. He goes, if you touch me, I'll go down. You can't reach out to the human. God was using an anointing that would flow through him to, to do a ministry, but don't ever reach out to the human. It will cause Benny to, does that make sense? There's an intimacy that I'm like, okay, what is he saying? Like he, and he correct the guy in love. He's like, don't do that. He, don't do that. And, and he said it, and he said it in Benny's way of love. And then there was a, another person that came up there. It was a big guy. Um, probably in his, maybe his early 30s. And now listen to the intimacy that Benny walks with the Lord. And, I, and this is what I'm saying. God, do that. I want, I want to know you like that. He said to the guy, do you have, uh, he had back pain. And he said that there was a like, a, was it heat on him? Or was he electricity? No, he was heat. Like there was heat all through his body and his back pain was gone. And it was excruciating. And he said, do you have, do you have, parents in the ministry he said no do you, do you have grandparents and he said no he goes the way he said it was okay follow me here the way he said it was 
Benny could perceive that there were prayers that were coming at him and towards him and that were, there was a pressure of prayers that were coming on him. And I believe what I'm understanding, because anointing breaks a yoke, I believe what Benny knew, that there was a yoke that was going to be broke. And he goes, up, he goes, somebody's praying for you. There's prayers that are coming at you, and they're coming. And, and a person said, his wife, and he goes, she's going to get what she wants. And she, he breathed on her, broke the yoke off of him, and boom, he went down. So there's something was intimate enough for him to know the Lord that he could sense the prayers that were coming towards the guy, the yoke on the guy. And the Bible says the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. So in Benny's intimacy and the crushing that he has been through, there's an intimacy that he can walk with. And there was another girl that came up. He didn't want to expose. The Lord gave him something about her. He went up to her. He just quietly went up to her, and she had a, a physical ailment, and he said, this is just between she and what the Lord had said to me. This is intimate. He dropped his mic, whispered to her, and all you could hear was, go, and boom. He's like, it's gone. So whatever that was, there was a revelation knowledge that was happening because of Benny's intimacy with the Lord in the crushing. You turn pain into glory that glory you turn our pain into glory our need for him now becomes a position in a place where he can fill that need and where he can fill that with his glory and we'll end it here he gives you the crown of glory let's go to first peter 4 14 and we're done musicians you can come but please have ears to hear because this is really 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 good first peter <clears throat> The Bible talks about in, in Psalms that he's the king of glory. That the king of glory would enter in 1 Peter. Chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Getting there. Okay, 1 Peter, chapter 4. Verse 10, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as a good steward. He stewarded the things that God has spoken to him. He stewards his prayer life. He stewards his worship. And he calls, he's intimate. There's a, there's a, a, a respect, a beauty that he has with this relationship with Jesus that the, and, the, and Jesus' image, they have that. It's like, it's, it's, your, my, it's called, my heart is longing for that, understanding. Like, God, I want to know you like that. And as a good steward of the manifold grace of God, um, he says here in verse 12, Believe it, our beloved, think it not strange concerning a fiery trial when it comes to try you, as though some strange thing is happening to you. This is what's going to happen. There's going to be a fiery trial won't be your sin story it'll be a fiery trial different than your sin story and it's a strange thing it's a it's a work of god's grace and mercy and it's his wonderful work but rejoice in it as much as you are gonna you're gonna begin to be partakers of christ's suffering that when his glory will be revealed his glory will become will come and it will be revealed and it's going to start to rest on you. Listen to this. It'll start to rest on you. It says, his glory shall be revealed and you will be glad also with exceeding joy. And if you get reproached for the name of Christ, happier are you, you, ye for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And on their part, they'll speak evil of, but on your part, he's going to be glorified. He's the king of glory. But if any man suffer as a Christian, let, it, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly of the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer 
according to the will of God, this fiery trial sent. When you begin to suffer in that, it's the will of God. Commit the keeping of your soul. He's the good shepherd of your soul. And, and, and keeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Let's all close our eyes and let's pray. Dear Jesus, I just thank you, God, for your word. It really is alive. I know that it spoke to many people in different ways. But God, may that glory come in that trial of faith. The things that we go through and will grow through will be allowing you to lead us into those still waters. The guardian, the good shepherd of our souls. May we commit our soul to you. God, I just thank you for the work, your perfect work. And in Colossians, it tells us to seek you first and set our affection on things above where our life is hid with Christ in God. And I just thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, that, that we wouldn't be left the same, that when we begin to sing, we'll enter in. Our heart will begin to desire to enter in. And God, when we pray, our heart will begin to enter in and we'll begin to steward our heart and we'll begin to hear your voice lead us and we will begin to understand your glory and we'll begin to grow in intimacy with you so may we be about your business lord and may whatever you speak to us lord god we begin to honor you may we begin to allow your word to direct us correct us instruct us in righteousness that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good work. And I just thank you, God, for your word. May this be a, a meat, a meaty meal that fills people up. And may they never be the same because of this meal. In Jesus' name. Something. that you would be magnified through this ministry today, God. God, I pray that our offering, that our, our worship um, would just be pleasing to you, God. And I pray that as we go about our days that we would remember the different points, different things that you wanted to speak to us as individuals. And God, may we apply them. Thank you, God, for your words, our life. And God, there's nowhere else that we can go to receive that except to you. And we praise you. We thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, and your love. 
if there's anybody out there that the sound of my voice, you're welcome to join us Sundays at 4 o'clock, uh, 3101 at Cherry Street in Hoquiam. Um, have a blessed week. Thank you guys for being here, everybody who's here. Welcome to you guys. Um, Lord be glorified. Have a good week. Bye-bye.